My message is going to come from Isaiah 53, 1 through 5. And it talks, 53, 1 through 4, talks about how Jesus was rejected, how he was despised, and the people turned their backs against Jesus, and they didn't care. We did that also before we got saved. We did not want nothing to do about, with Jesus. We didn't want to hear nobody talk about him. So the same, same things they did, we did it also. He carried our weaknesses, and that weighed him down. And we thought that his sins was a punishment from God, but his own sins. And, but my main text is going to come out of Isaiah 53, 5, which it says, But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And some virgins say he was... Uh, Sorry, he was wounded, he was, my mouth is so dry, I am so sorry. <laughs> Can someone give me some water, please? And I'm not nervous, I'm really not. But um, some Bible ver uh, is, has a different version, but I use the, uh, international, the NIV. But my two, my, there's three particular points I'm going to make out of this, uh, out of verse 5. We're going to talk about salvation, wholeness, and healing. And salvation comes from Romans 9, Romans 10, 9 through 10. And it says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we shall be saved. That he is raised from, that as God raised him up from the dead, you will be saved. For this is by believing in your heart that we are made right with God. Now I understand why Pastor Rusty have water. <laughs> uh, and the, so we are made right with God, and it is by confessing with our mouth that you are saved. The key word is heart. Believing in your heart that Jesus died transform us from darkness into light. And the message of salvation is in our heart and it's on our lips, and it comes out of our mouth, and it's our testimony. Everybody have a testimony. I have a testimony. We need to share our testimony in the year of 2019. With this new life, we have a purpose. And we need to tell others about Jesus. And I'm going to tell you a story about Jonah. Jonah had a purpose, but he was running from it. Jonah, Jesus told Jonah to go to Nineveh and tell the people that if they didn't turn away from their wicked ways in 40 days, that he was going to bring judgment upon them. So Jonah decided that he was, you know, I don't want to do this, so he started running. So he gets on this ship, and, the, and God sent a storm. And this storm was so raging that it was tossing the ship back and forth. The water was all up on the boat, and... And the people, the sailors got scared, and they didn't know what to do. And they start praying to their gods, and that didn't have, you know, they couldn't do nothing for them. And then they decided they would throw overboard some of their cargo, and that still didn't stop the storm. So the only person that was on their ship was Jonah. So they went and talked to Jonah, like, what's going on? You know, our, the storm, this great storm is coming. What do you do? And Jonah said, I'm running from God. Sometimes we find ourselves running from God, too, because we don't want to do what God tells us to do. So Jonah, um, so the sailors said, well, what do we want to do with you? What are we going to do? This, you know, we can't survive with this storm. Jonah said, throw me overboard. So they threw him overboard. So by the time Jonah hit the sea, the, the storm stopped. But Jonah didn't realize that there was other obstacles in front of him. When he hit the sea, God sent a great uh, fish, swallowed Jonah up. Jonah stayed in the fish belly for three days and three nights. You all know the story. So Jonah had time to think about what he was going to do. Was he going to go and do what God says do? Is he going to do it his way or what? So Jonah started praying. And listen to what Jonah said at the end of his prayer in uh, Jonah 2, verse 9. And it says, but I will offer sacrifice to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows. And the underlying word, please, everybody say. For the salvation comes from the Lord alone. So Jonah had the time to think about 
what he was doing. And his salvation comes from the Lord alone. Our salvation comes from the Lord alone. And um, so when, John, when God heard Jonah's prayer, that fish just spit Jonah right out of his mouth on the beach. So Jonah decided he was going to do what he promised to do, that he vowed to do. So Jonah went and delivered the message to the people in Nineveh. The Nineveh the people received uh, God's message. And then Jonah, he still had a little bit of, I call it a little bit of doubt, a little bit. He wasn't sure what God was going to do, but he knew God really well. But he still didn't know if the people was really repented and was going to follow behind Jesus. So he, he walked and he set himself outside the city and put himself up a shelter. And it was hot. Who would want to sit out in the hot sun? But he did. So God had mercy upon Jonah again. God sent a leafy uh, plant to uh, shade Jonah to put him out of the hot sun. And I guess Jonah stayed there too long for God, so he said, mm, he ain't doing nothing. So he decided he was going to send a worm, and, he, and the worm ate the plant. Jonah got real angry. I mean, he, I mean, how can you be angry? You're supposed to do jo God's job, but he was so angry that God showed, you know, wanted him to do this work for him. And then so um, Jonah got so angry, he kind of just told God, just let me die. Who want to die? My, I always say, um, don't help me die early. You know, God knows when I'm going to die, so I don't need no help. So I don't know why Jonah want to die. But uh, look how God responded to Jonah in chapter 4, 10, and 11. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there? It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Should not feel sorry for such a great city. Jonah was so concerned about himself at that point that he lost the big picture. There was 120,000 people in Nineveh that was living in darkness. And God was so concerned about them, and all he wanted Jonah to do was go tell the people to turn away from their wicked ways before judgment came on them. And you know, God is concerned about our Nineveh's. Our Nineveh is our neighborhoods. Our Nineveh is our family. Our Nineveh is our co-workers. And anybody that we run into, they are our Nineveh. And God is just as concerned about them as he was about the 120,000. And, you know, God has a purpose and a plan for all of us. And we may not be a pastor. We may not be a teacher. We not, may not be a worship leader. But we do have a voice. And our voice is to go out and tell others about Jesus. Tell them about the salvation that is free for them from Jesus who died on the cross for them. My next point is wholeness. Wholeness, we are made whole by reconnecting ourselves to Jesus so that we can live a righteous life and live a cross-centered life. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, don't, don't copy the behavior and custom of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, and then you will learn know how God's will for you is good and pleasing and perfect. And Paul is the person I chose to talk about because Paul went through a lot. And Paul, before he got converted, he was called Saul. And you can find that in chapter 9. And I'm just going to tell you the story about Paul. And if I say Paul, you know I mean Saul. So if I say Saul, it's Paul because he's the same person. Uh, so um, Saul, at this time, he... Saul was a persecutor. He killed believers. He burned down the churches. He threw believers in jail. He didn't, um, he just didn't like Christians. And 
So he just did everything he could to destroy them. And he even went as far as to threaten the high priests so that they could cooperate him so that he could throw the followers of Jesus in jail or to arrest him. And so one day, Saul was on, on the road to Damascus, and this great light shone down on Saul. And the light was so bright that it blinded Saul. Just imagine, one day you can see, and then all of a sudden you can't see nothing. And I thought, I, I kind of laughed at myself. I said, you know, if, uh, if we go to heaven in this fleshly body, and it was so bright, we would, be, we would have to wear dark glasses like the men in black did. So, and I said, thank God that we have a spiritual body so when we get to heaven that we can see all the glory that is there. And, uh, and it was just like, it was just darkness for Saul then. And then so um, God sent An Ananias to talk to uh, Saul to tell him that it was him that was on the, the path to Damascus, that that was God that shone down on him. And so, and he wanted Saul to take the message of salvation to the Gentiles. And when uh, God told Ananias to do this, Ananias was like, Lord, do you know who this man is? He kills us. And you want me to go and talk to him? And, you know, if that was me, I would be kind of scared a little bit too. I would I had to think on it. I would have to ask God, are you sure you really want me to go over there? What if I die? But Ananias knew God, so he had, had it made either way. So if he... If he died, he was going to go, see, go to heaven to see Jesus. And if he went, he would have did God's will anyway. So Ananias had it made both ways. So he went and he told Saul what to do. And then as soon as Ananias told Saul that he was the one that God had chosen to preach to the Gentiles, the scales on his eyes fell off and he could see. And at that moment, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul lived, from that point on, Paul had a, uh, he was living in darkness, and now he's living in the light. And Paul has such a passion for those Gentiles. Uh, Paul started living a cross-centered life. Uh, Paul became a missionary, and he did just what God told him to do. Because Paul was so convicted of, about the gift of salvation that it was for the Gentiles as well as it was for the Jews. Salvation is for everybody. It's not just for us, it's for everybody. No matter where you come from, no matter what background you are, it's for everybody. And Paul, he just had a spiritual awakening. He experienced something that none of the other people had ever experienced. And so, and that's all Paul preached, Jesus' death, and his uh, resurrection, because it changed people's lives, it brought righteousness to people, and it transformed our lives. I know it transformed my life when I got saved, because I know I carried a lot of heavy weight. But as soon as I got saved, I always tell you know people, and I told my husband, when I got saved, um, it was like uh, stuff lifted up off of me. I felt released. I felt not weighed down anymore, you know. I just felt free, not from everything, but I just felt free from that moment of just stuff. And I thank God for that. And so, but Paul preached other things, but he always brought it back to the cross, Jesus' death and his resurrection. Let's be a Paul and not be ashamed of the gospel. So let's go tell others about Jesus in this year of 2019 coming up. So we talked about salvation. We have to um, believe in our heart that Jesus died for us and he rose again. And then we talked about wholeness. We have to be reconnected to God, to God so we can live a righteous life. And my last point is on healing. Healing is to men to make whole and well. Matthews 8, 14 through 15 talks about uh, 
how Peter's mother-in-law was sick, and they called Jesus to come to heal her. And Jesus was there, and he healed his, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. And what she do? She gets up and cook him a meal. What more can you ask for, <laughs> you know? That's, I guess, that was his payment for coming for all the work that he did, so she cooked him a meal. But I know she was thankful, and Peter was thankful that God touched her. And then the word got out that Jesus was at that house, and then all kinds of people started coming. People that was demon-possessed got delivered. People with all kinds of sicknesses got healed. And, man, I was like, what if God come to my house? Come over, everybody. Just line up, you know? And if you think about it, that's what Jesus did even when he fed the 5,000, you know. Uh, but he fed them after they got spiritually fed. So remember, you have to feed your spirit man as well as your natural man. So uh, Jesus, he's just, he did it all. And then in Matthew uh, 8, verse 17, it says, this fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said he took our sickness and removed our diseases. He did it on the cross. No matter what kind of disease you have, no matter what kind of sickness you have, Jesus can heal you. He will make you whole. He will uh, make you clean. Anything that you have, Jesus can heal your body. He did it all on the cross for us. So we should put our trust in him no matter what we see. Um, you know, our bodies are flesh. And we know our bodies is going to be, we're going to get some kind of diseases. We're going to get some kind of aches and pains. Uh, we're not going to still be young and and vibrant like we used to be, you know. We are not going to do things we used to do when we was like 19 or 20. As we get old, things start breaking down, things start hurting. And God didn't promise us that we was going to, that this body was going to live forever. And things do come our way. Sickness do come our way. Diseases do come our way. We may not want it, but it's coming. And it all depends on how you handle the situation. You know, if you handle the situation in fear and despair and woe is me and you don't know who to turn to, it, you're going to have it rough. You, it's going to be rough. But if you know who you believe and trust in and who you depend on, God will see you through. And you have the faith. Everybody has the faith. Because God said if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. So you can speak healing to your body. You can speak wholeness to your body because you have that faith to do that. When uh, sickness or unexpected crisis come into my life, I like to talk about Job. I love Job. Um, Job went through a lot. And... Um, Job, he was a wealthy man, he had children, and he was respected by all people. And then one day, Job lost everything. He lost his wealth, he lost his children, sickness took over his body, and the people thought Job had sinned. And they were, you know, Job had friends that that came and talked to him, but they wasn't very encouraging. You know, when you have tragic in your life, you don't need someone to, to look at you as if you done sin or look at you to judge you like what happened to you. You don't need that. And um, I'm going to share my testimony about the tragic that happened in my life. And my family don't know I'm going to share it, but I am. And um, we had a daughter named Madeline. And one, one day, she left the house, and she, that's the last time I seen her. And she said, Mom, would you take care of her? 
and she was talking about Deja. And uh, I said, yes. So she left out of the house, and I never seen her again. She was in a car accident, and uh, she was with her brother. And that is the most devastating thing you can ever have in your life when you, you're not expecting it. You don't know why it happened, but it did. Either you're going to do two things. Either you're going to hold on to God or you're going to run away from God or you're going to blame God. And, you know, as I think about it now, as I was wondering what I was going to say, um, and as I look back, you know, God knew this was going to happen. And the way things went was the fact that he put people all in our lives to help us to get through this. Um, there was a lot of things that we had to do um, for Deja. There was a lot of uh, things that my husband had to do for me to help me. And we leaned on each other. And... Um, it was kind of like the whole life was, had been knocked right out of me. And I don't think I really, I really didn't have too much time to think about things and what had happened because it was so much other stuff going around me. So I, you know, I remember there's things that God would let you remember and there's things that you really don't want to remember. And so I remember when we was here at Clinton Valley and, and they did the service and whatever. And a lot of my coworkers was here. And when it was over, I remember getting up out of the seat and I was walking back. And I could hear my coworkers says, I don't know who it was, but they said, man, she's doing good. Look at her. I don't see how she can do that. But you know what, on the inside, I wasn't doing so good. But on the outside, you have to press through, no matter how you feel on the inside. And one thing I learned from this experience is also is that you can't go by your feelings. Because if you go by your feelings, you're going to be messed up. You know, because then that's when all of the doubt and the fear and everything else start coming in. Because I know I did not feel God for a long time. But I knew he was there. And I know Job felt like God wasn't there in his time. I mean, Job was broke down. His wealth, I don't have no wealth, but I could imagine him not having no wealth, you know. Him being wealthy and all his monies and all his possessions that he had, just gone. And then all his children, all of his children, not just one child, but all of his children was gone. Then he had all this sickness and all these boils all on his body. But see, I had another child that was sick too. And he was in the hospital. His collar was broke. They had to do surgery on him. But then I had to look at the whole situation. God could have took both of them. But he didn't. He left one. And I'm thankful. And every time I look at him, and every time I think about it, I said, thank you, Jesus, for not taking them both, because he knew. He knew who was ready, and he knew who had to stay. And God knows exactly what he be doing. Job didn't know what God was doing, but God did. And I didn't know exactly what God was doing, but he did. And everything worked out. God restored Job. He gave him everything back to him. But what the, the, the part that I really love about Job is that the ones that, that, wasn't, that wasn't encouraging Job at all, that's where he got his wealth from. God told them, give Job this amount, that amount. And that's how Job's wealth started back up again. Because he wasn't pleased with those guys, what they was telling uh, Job, because they wasn't telling Job right. They wasn't encouraging Job. They was just talking. But God restored them. 
He restored me. He restored my family. He put the joy back in my heart. Because there's times, I mean, I came to church. I never missed church. I sat over there, me and my husband and Deja, we sat there. It was difficult at times. I still raised my hand, but I, I didn't feel anything. That's why you can't go on feelings, because God knew. Just like that song say, he, he split the sea, and he walked right through it. I was walking through it but I didn't feel it. Job walked through it, and he didn't feel him either. I, I mean, you know, you can. I didn't. But one day, when I was sitting in church, and uh, we was praising God, and it came back. The joy that I had missed came back. I tell you, I think I shouted for about five minutes. <laughs> I remember I was standing over there. The song was going. I, had, I got my shout on. I didn't care who was looking at me. I was always been like that. If a song touched me and, I, and Jesus touched me, I tell you, I shout. I don't care who's looking. I will shout in a minute. And I tell you what, I shouted and I shouted and I shouted because I knew if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't have made it. And I don't know how people can do it without Jesus. That's what the cross means to me. Because each time I look around at my children, they all are not saved. But I tell you what, the light that I live through the cross and live in that cross life in front of them, I know God's going to save them all. And I know what God can do. 